up to you. Are we ready to go? Are, AV, are we ready to go? Are we ready to go? Okay. I want to introduce this next talk. This is the science of insecurity. This is not only a lot of very good research that has important things to say about what we do as an industry itself, but this was some of the last work that Len Sassman, who was part of the SHMU group, did, and Meredith and Sergey will be presenting. Good afternoon, everyone. This talk is about the science of insecurity by which we mean the entire spectrum of exploits and vulnerabilities considered as a systematic, repeatable, and most importantly, predictive mathematical model. We're going to examine from first principles what it is about exploits that makes them exploits in the first place and how we can use this systematic understanding to design and implement software in which, to borrow a turn of phrase from Dan Kaminsky, entire classes of bugs simply don't exist. But before I get going, I want to remark on another recent talk that focused on Turing machines, Cory Doctorow's talk at the Chaos Computer Congress on the coming war on general computation, which you can find on YouTube or transcribed online. You're going to hear a lot in the next hour about certain hazards of Turing complete protocols, and I need to make clear that what we're inveighing against is Turing machine computational power in very specific places, namely the communication boundaries between Turing complete systems. Your CPU needs to be able to, form, to perform arbitrary computation. ICMP ECHO does not. So that's an important distinction and do please keep it in mind. But more important than that are Corey's spot on observations about how the sausage gets made, how lawmakers and vendors conspire to herd users into walled gardens where, oh by the way, the folks doing the herding can lock out competitors and bleed those users to their heart's content. It's the oldest game in the book and it's already underway in the United States. Right now, there's an initiative under development called NISTIC, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, which is really just the old carrot and stick game aimed at conning citizens into voluntarily giving up any possibility of anonymity online, which is really the same as free speech online when you get right down to it, by holding out the carrot of quote unquote safe walled gardens like the iOS app store and social networks like Google Plus, where the price of admission is your offline identity, backed up with a stick made from the specter of spam and malware and evil cyber criminals on the filthy, nasty internet. And no matter how rotten the carrot really is, the thing about human psychology is, once someone has bought into lofty and nebulous promises about matters such as security, it becomes really hard to convince them that the carrot cake is a lie. So our other option is to break the stick, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I actually owe this observation to my husband, Len Sassaman, who, as John said, was a member of the SHMU. Um, he started his career working in anonymity and privacy under Bart Purnell at uh, the Catholic University of Leuven. But in 2009, he shifted focus to working on the language theoretic security research that I sort of accidentally stumbled over in 2005 because he was convinced that the future of an open internet depends on smoothing out the attack surface in order to break the stick that, that, that I spoke about just before. So if you take away anything at all from this talk, it's this. I want you to understand that the vast majority of insecurity on the internet 
comes from protocol and message format designs that, for a variety of reasons, and we'll get into those, require you to solve problems that we can prove cannot possibly be solved. Now, not every bug falls into this class. There were a lot of questions after my CCC talk about, uh, well, what does this have to do with timing attacks? Well, and things like that. Well, actually, nothing. We're specific. However, the class of bugs that we're talking about, input handling, uh, input handling bugs, really does comprise a ridiculously large amount of uh, the classifications of vulnerabilities that you tend to see. Um, if you set yourself up against a law of nature, all you're going to do is make the attack surface larger and larger and larger. But there is a principled way to avoid doing this. Think about language theory when you're handling your inputs. We've been living on borrowed time. When the NSA tells you that there's no such thing as secure anymore, they're probably not kidding. A year ago, Brian Snow was asserting that we just had a few weeks to months before a security meltdown occurred. And I think in the wake of, uh, of anti-sec, lulsec, um, and the anonymous, uh, the anonymous attacks that continue to go on, his words are getting borne out pretty successfully. And this has not been for a lack of trying. Trustworthy computing initiatives have existed for decades. Bookstores everywhere will sell, will sell you books on secure coding. There are dozens of academic conferences and journals that uh, try to address this problem. Um, we have fuzzing, we have binary analysis, we have all kinds of testing methods and software is still terrible. And don't even get me started on hardware. Um, hardware verification has, has long been a, a a goal of the industry, but we're really not much farther along than we were 30, 40, 50 years ago. How did we end up with this kind of ubiquitous pwnage? I mean, is everybody really just that incompetent? No. I, I, I genuinely do not believe that everybody in this room is stupid. If you were stupid, you wouldn't be here. That said, there is a systematic underpinning to insecurity that really the hacker community has been building up over time and we've now, we've now got to this critical mass where we can actually identify the systematic underpinnings of what it is that makes things go wrong. So what is it that makes things go wrong? Well, I, say, I, mean, I, I referred to the laws of physics earlier, but really what we're talking about are the laws of mathematics. Our physicists are people like Bertrand Russell, Kurt Gödel, Alan Turing, and other people who tried to universalize mathematics from axioms. Now the problem that we as security researchers want to solve is quite a bit more focused than the problem that they wanted to solve, which is actually a really good thing because it turns out that the problem that they wanted to solve is unsolvable. But we start in the very same way, which is to say formalizing the question, what is insecurity? So what is insecurity? There have been quite a few attempts to classify, to define and classify what it is. And some of those attempts have been actually harmful, like the idea that insecurity is a way for you to sneak uh, some malicious code. And as long as no one could sneak that malicious code into your system, you are secure. That is wrong. That has been proven wrong by the hacker community with what later, when the academic community caught on in seven to eight years, depending on how you count, got known as the return-oriented programming uh, in our paper that's linked on the website of, of uh, this effort. Uh, you will see uh, a history of that. Is it memory corruption? Yes. Is it in-band signaling? Yes. Is it exposing unnecessary privilege? Maybe all of the above, and I'm losing, uh, I'm uh, leaving out quite a number of things. Well then, this is the operative definition of vulnerability that Wikipedia has. And it starts with things I can believe, such as complexity, familiarity, connectivity. Well, yeah, and then browsing websites on the internet. So like, what do I do? <laughs> Don't make my head explode. And what that signals us is that we're dealing with a classification without an underlying principle. One of uh, these classifications, an imaginary one, 
was cooked up by Jorge Luis Borges in the analytical language of John Wilkins. Uh, and he ascribes it to a certain uh, Chinese encyclopedia, uh, the treasure of heavenly knowledge, uh, if I remember correctly. And these animals are divided into belonging to the emperor, uh, tame, suckling pigs, those that just broke the water pitcher, uh, those included in the current classification. Bonus points if you can, bonus points if you happen to know what paradox that is. But what that tells us is that if your classification looks like this, you're probably not seeing the underlying origin of the species you are trying to classify. So it's true that we can and we should classify exploits by similarity, but we're setting ourselves up for failure if all we look at is the surface similarity and not the underlying structural similarity. Back in the, back in the early days of biology, Lamarck, uh, tried to classify uh, tried to classify species entirely by uh, by surface phenotype, and this ended up not being true at all. Once Watson and Crick uncovered the structure of DNA, we were able to identify common descent patterns among species, and that actually told us something meaningful about how they're related. Following along, the, uh, following along the example from biological, to, uh, biological cladistics, we need a science of computational cladistics. They provided the computational model for biological systems. We need to provide a similar model for actual computational systems. And this is the fundamental observation that we need to make in order to do this. Insecurity is fundamentally about computation. Our trust in computer systems is based on what the system can and cannot compute. Examine any statement, any assertion that you trust about the computing system. You will, such as, will it drop a shell or not? Or will it expose your data or not? It will come down to this, what the system can and cannot compute. We see that uh, in the antivirus industry an antivirus or an IDS is a piece of computation that is supposed to decide where, whether an input is good or bad. Can it be trusted to do that? Can the system be trusted to input its input and safely reject it if it's wrong? Exploitation is a phenomenon that is essentially unexpected computation. Exploit is something that runs reliably on the target and causes an unexpected computation to occur. In fact, you should consider an exploit as a program coded in crafted input that runs on the target and exposes new computational structures, those that you don't expect in the target. So, I mentioned input handling. This turns out to be the key. Can this input hurt? Is this input good? Checking whether the input is as you expect can in fact be an unsolvable problem, an undecidable problem that, there, that theory, mathematics, proves that you cannot do cannot solve, no matter how much effort you put into it. And not surprisingly, this is where, as we hope to show, the insecurity flows from. When you are trying to implement an algorithm that cannot exist, uh, you are bound to fail. Everything in our world is distributed these days. Everything is composed. Programs consist of many components that, at the very least, must do two things. First, they must accept inputs, messages that come over some communication medium. Second, they must reject those that they do not accept safely. Secondly, when components communicate, the message as meant and as sent 
should be perceived exactly as it was meant. That is to say, the components uh, that are communicating must have their parsers interpreting and generally semantic interpreters of messages interpret them identically. And this is exactly where undecidable problems attack. Some protocols are so complex that the decision between the good and bad is a decision you cannot possibly make because the underlying mathematical problem is undecidable. Some, pro some protocols are so complex that validating whether the two recognizers that accept messages and parse them for you are equivalent is undecidable. And we're going to show that these problems lurk much closer than you expect. In fact, they underlie many of the famous vulnerabilities that came out, uh, such as uh, the uh, SSL vulnerabilities that Ellen and Meredith uh, discovered and presented uh, two years ago. Yeah. So our perspective on insecurity becomes that on handling inputs and inputs are a language, as in formal language, the structures that the theory of formal languages studies. And if you think about it, uh, this is uh, how you should see it. This is how those languages are, how those messages are formatted. And the automata that recognize them are also uh, a phenomenon of language theory and computability theory. Some languages are much harder to recognize than others. This is mathematical hardness. This is the kind of hardness that we uh, depend on for the security of, say, crypto systems. And finally, if you paint yourself into a corner, setting yourself through the design of your input language a problem that is undecidable and cannot be solved, then this is going to be a wellspring of insecurity otherwise known as the fountain of zero day. So, oh, fountain of youth. <laughs> what happens when input recognition fails? Imagine, if you will, the structure of a program as you would see it in uh, IDA Pro. Some of those basic blocks will be recognition blocks, sanity checks, input checks, uh, the parser, the recognizer. Some of those would be the actual things that you want to do with the data, the processing code. Now, when you do not do uh, all the checks that need to be done on a piece of data, that's where you expose a memory corruption. Some expectation by a block in the code is not fulfilled. The block does something that is unexpected. The unexpected computation occurs. That's where a memory corruption happens. An implicit data flow to other blocks. And finally, we get what is known as a weird machine. That is to say, a more powerful computational structure driven by crafted input that is running your actual exploit. So how does this happen? Well, a lot of it has to do with how we engineer software. Think about how you typically go about uh, implementing a protocol. You've got, right there in your RFC, a nice little ABNF definition sitting there in the appendix that tells you exactly what the syntactic structure of this packet is supposed to look like. But do you actually parse the entire packet as a packet? Probably not. No, you're going to be peeling off an int here, a car there, an array here. And these checks get scattered for all throughout the program with pieces of programming logic in between them. We refer to this as a shotgun parser, by analogy to shotgun debugging. Shotgun debugging is not your friend, and shotgun parsing is not either. When you are intermingling input recognition with state, you are opening yourself up to logic flows that you were not expecting, and this happens. Vaguely understood input languages are the mother of Ode, and even if your input language is well understood, if you are combining the 
code flow of input, of input handling and input processing, you're opening yourself up to problems. Because your cute little, your cute little shell code chestburster just comes popping right out. So let's look at this problem from uh, the exploiter point of view. Uh, I highly recommend uh, the talk by Haller Flake at Infiltrate 2011, uh, where he describes exploitation as setting up, instantiating, and programming a weird machine. The term itself got coined at uh, uh, RSS Recurity, uh, Security Seminar in Berlin in 2000, um, just prior to that. And what you actually get out of your program is exposition of the primitives that you can steer with your input from state to state and from transition to transition that were not meant to happen in the original code. So you get an automaton that was implicitly there and you explicitly instantiated with your crafted input, which is why uh, which is uh, where the Turing beast uh, comes out of the corner and eats all of your expectations of security and of your, your reliable computation. And, you know, who let that dog out? Well, the inputs did. So, in order to slay that Turing beast, we have to go back to the Turing future and uh, stay with me. And uh, go back to how computation that we want to prevent the unauthorized instances of was conceived of as a general thing. We have to go back to the Turing and Church. We have to go back to how they conceptualized what computation actually is and what the automata that perform it are and what the hierarchy of those automata is. So, this may sound academic, but this is driven entirely by exploitation experience. Academics study models and produce publishable results. It's very hard to produce a publishable result when you have to find the model, extract the model instead. Uh, from where we stand, the subject of hacking has been exposing the actual computational structures as opposed to those that the model said they were supposed to be there, and discovering the computational limits of real systems, which is exactly the contribution of Church and Turing. So Turing machines and the limits of computation, they uh, come uh, together close and uh, uh, hand in hand. So a Turing machine is a model of a computer that was specifically designed to study what is computable. And of course, you know the Turing machine as any sort of a processor that you have in your computer, phone, keyboard. Now, there is a class of problems that you cannot write a program for. These are the problems that the Turing machine cannot solve. And if you went to a, a school in CS, you will hear this mantra, the halting problem is undecidable. What does that mean? If somebody in the bar approaches you and says, I can build a Turing machine, a program, that takes another Turing machine, another program, as input and decide if, we'll, if it will ever terminate or loop, don't trust that man in the bar. Because this is against the laws of nature. This is exactly the same sort of a failure and exactly the, source of a, the same sort of a sales pitch as uh, selling you perpetual motion. This cannot be done in general. There is no 80-20 engineering solution for the halting problem. So some designs, and this is the key point, force programmers to actually start solving the undecidable uh, halting problem. And this is where input handling runs totally aground when you want to do secure software. The bad news 
is that no amount of testing or fixing will help because the problem is actually unsolvable. The good news is that you can avoid it in most of the cases that are actually important in real life. So as we said, there is no 80-20 engineering solution for this problem. If somebody buys this on your behalf, fire them, because you don't want to be around when it breaks. And this is counterintuitive, okay? We're really used to seeing more effort incrementally improve the results. But again, there's a reason we refer to this as a fountain of O'Day. Um, in, a, uh, in, a, in a few slides, I'll be talking about the attacks that Len and Dan Kaminsky and I did on X509 back in uh, 2009, where we, where we used a problem that uh, reduces to the halting problem, which is to say it's mathematically equivalent to the halting problem, to generate fake cert after fake cert after fake cert that browsers recognized as valid. We were sitting there with you know, perfectly valid certs for PayPal, eBay, Google, whatever. They actually only worked in certain browsers, which was kind of funny. But you know, the, the end of the story is you know, we, we stopped when we were bored. We didn't, fit, we, did, we didn't stop when we were done. We stopped when we were like, okay, we got enough for a paper now. <laughs> All right, so we've been, we've been using this word undecidable. Let's see if you understand what we think it means. <laughs> All right, so back in the 17th century, a mathematician by the name of Leibniz poses the question, is it possible for a machine to determine the truth value of an arbitrary mathematical statement. So, you know, Boolean logic, we, we've got some propositions, we and some of them together, we or the rest of them together. Can a machine look at that and determine whether that's true? So then, in 1928, Hilbert extend, extends that a little farther and formalizes it into uh, the third, uh, the third of, his, of his famous list of problems, the, the Entscheidung's problem, is an arbitrary logical statement valid or invalid. Um, and then a couple years later, Church and Turing come along uh, piggybacking off the work of Kleene and Gödel, and they're, they're like, uh, no, actually, can't happen. So, phrasing this in slightly more uh, layman's terms, uh, so back in November, uh, Quinn Norton, who is currently embedded with Occupy for Wired, was thinking about going to the general strike uh, for uh, Occupy Oakland. But she, she's a reporter. She's embedded there. So she can't go to the, uh, to, the, to the general strike without being on the job. Does not compute. Well, you know, Bertrand, loves, uh, Bertrand Russell loves you and wants you to be happy. Um, but unfortunately, he can't solve this problem either. So there's this thing called the Curry-Howard correspondence, which is actually one of the most beautiful results in all of mathematics. And what it basically says is that programs are proofs and proofs are programs. Felix Lindner loves to say, you can't argue with a root shell. This is because a program is a proof. An exploit is a proof that something ain't right in your code, that your code is not doing what it says on the tin. It is quite literally a proof by construction of unexpected computation. Now, we may be able to come up with a formal duality for this, but probably not that interesting for this, uh, for this particular conference. So. so we come back to the perspective of inputs being considered as that which drives computation, that which drives the automata recognizing them, and uh, we remind you that from the, uh, fr th this view from the Tower of Babel is going to uh, put some perspective into the wellspring of insecurity that comes when you try to parse a more complex language or ac recognize or accept a more complex language with an automaton that is not meant for the job, is underpowered, or, in fact, your language is way, way too hard for any automaton to recognize. All right, so we've, we've referenced the existence of different categories of formal languages. Let's talk about those now. It's hierarchical. Um, the Turing complete languages are, uh, are those that are what we call recursively enumerable. But they're scary. Let's not talk about them right now. Let's actually start from the bottom. So, Everybody here familiar with regular expressions? 
Cool. All right. That's a great start. We like regular expressions because they're very, very easy to work with. They're very, very decidable. Um, they're, they're so decidable, in fact, that if you have two separate regular expressions, you can, deci you can decide in pretty convenient time whether, they, uh, whether both uh, regular expressions actually express the same language or not. This one's easy. We're done with that one. So the context-free languages, uh, hands up if you speak Perl. Cool. So you know how you can do all the, you know how you can do that grouping thing in Perl regular expressions where they can basically recurse on themselves. That actually means that they're context-free grammars. Perl regular expressions are more powerful than they're supposed to be. Um, context-sensitive languages. Um, these are sort of imagine the context-free languages, but with the ability to refer to other uh, to other parts of the tree. So you can you can pay attention to things like okay. Um, I've got uh, a payload, and it's got a sp it's got a length that was specified earlier in the earlier in the packet. So I'll just refer back to that and check and make sure that the length field is in fact the same the, is in fact the same length as the payload I've gotten. All manner of silly padding attacks, as it turns out, depend on this not working right. Um, so one thing that happens a lot, um, and I've I've railed against this in many previous talks. Um, if you try to use a, a class of language that is too weak to attempt to validate uh, a string in another language, like say trying to use regular expressions to whitelist SQL, this fails again and again and again and again and again. So it is necessary when you are performing validation to use the appropriate strength automaton, which is to say regular with regular, context-free with context-free, et cetera, et cetera. The tools right now for being able to do context-free and higher validation kind of suck. We're working on that. So each of the following four slides is going to show you these increasingly complex ways of representing information in more and more detail. Um, so finite state machines provide you just very simple nesting structures. You know, what we've got up here is a regular expression that is equivalent to the graphical state machine displayed. Now, if you try to recursively nest any kind of structure into a, uh, into a, a regular expression, that's going to fail unless you're using Perl, but then it's really a context-free grammar, like we said. You can, if, you're, if, you're only, if you only have a finite amount of, uh, of recursion, then you're okay. But if you need to do it infinitely, like with, say, XML or HTML or S expressions or just you know, the language of balanced parentheses, whatever, that's not going to work. Instead, you need a context-free language, which you can basically imagine as being um, a finite state machine that also has a stack. And there, you can do arbitrary depth, uh, arbitrary depth nesting. So in the automaton that corresponds to a context-sensitive language is what we call a linear bounded automaton. Um, and this is basically a Turing machine that has a finite tape. Um, strictly speaking, a Turing machine has an infinite tape. If you give it a finite tape, then it's decidable. Roughly speaking, if you need some metadata in order to interpret the rest of your data, then that, uh, then that protocol is going to be, at, uh, at best, weakly context-sensitive. It could be much worse. Now, there was, uh, there was also some discussion after the CCC talk um, about things like length fields in finite length packets. Um, so I'll just go ahead and address that right now. Yes, strictly speaking, if your message format is finite, uh, you know, if it, like you know, IP, for instance, if it can't be longer than a certain length, yes, strictly speaking, you could parse that with a regular expression, but my god, you would not want to. The, the, the formalisms that we're discussing here, um, we're, 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 we're referring to them in the, way that, in, in the way that they are because conceptually it really is easier to, to work with the validation problem of, say, for instance, uh, a length field matching a payload when you have the more powerful formalism to help you. And, you know, beyond that, um, ASN1, for instance, um, Sucks to be you. ASN1 strings can be as long as they want to be. Um, so, you know, the, the pedantry is appreciated, um, but, you know, please, please bear with us on that, on, on that regard. We really are trying to help. All right. So finally, Turing-complete languages are, in the general case, undecidable. 
you know, if, if somebody sends you some JavaScript, the only thing you can do to tell whether that's, you know, whether that's going to start, say, you know, leaking information out over WebSockets or whatever is just to run the bastard or to hand audit it. But who has time to do that? So understanding the properties of these automata and the languages that they correspond to gives us the, the ability to stop weird machines in their tracks. They are the concepts that we need to stop weird machines, which we can do by constraining input language strength, and we must constrain to context-free or regular. So is it all about parser bugs? No. I said that at the beginning. We're not, we're not caring about timing attacks. You know, and at the end of the day, if you can't trust your CPU, there's not a whole lot I can do to help you. If you can't trust your compiler, if you can't trust your, your interpreter, there's not a lot I can do to help you. And you know, sometimes this happens in the real world. I was just talking with Travis Goodspeed the other day and he was telling me about a class assignment where he honest to God stumbled across an actual, an actual vulnerability in the CPU that he was working with. If, if that happens, there's not a lot we can do to help. But let, let's work on the low-hanging fruit for now. So. If you can establish that for the software you're writing, every program component that receives an input, well, actually, scratch that. Step zero, first, make sure that the, input for, that the inputs you expect to receive for, for your application or protocol are actually well-defined. If your specification contains a grammar and your implementation does not directly implement that grammar, your, your implementation is wrong, if your specification doesn't even include a spec for the input language, your specification is wrong, start over. So once you have that grammar, as long as the, once, if you have every program component that receives input having a recognizer, the recognizer has to match the language or else it's broken. And if neither the recognizer nor the language are well-defined or understood, then your program is broken. Let's put this in a practical terms. We talked about regular expressions and finite state machines, which allow you to express simple nesting in your data. And we assume that you want to nest data quite a bit, because as your programs are composed, so is your data. You can't achieve the complex behaviors you want from a computer without nesting some complexity into the data without combining pieces of data in larger and larger containers. So with irregular language, finite nesting is your friend. With a context-free language, regular expressions stop being your friend because regular expressions cannot parse recursive nested structures. So somewhere, somehow, you're going to make a mistake you're going to try to parse something that is deeper recursive than the maximum depth that your regular expression allows. Now, uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer 8 had that in their anti-cross-site scripting module, creating new vulnerabilities where none were. It does actually happen. And in fact, if you start looking deeper and deeper into things, it happens all over the place. In fact, since everything is a language, then so are network packets. Network packets have this nesting of structures and, oh my God, they have length fields. So they are really weakly context sensitive for the most part. The problem with that is when you start looking off of a pointer into what is the middle of a packet, can you really in that code that works with the data off of that pointer. Can you really determine whether the data is valid? Whether the next index is going to take you way out of the packet to create a memory overwrite, a primitive and a weird machine, or not? Can you determine that uh, the back reference, uh, say, as in DNS compression, is, again, correct and leads you to the right piece of code? If not, 
if you feel this pain of, I must validate, and I have no context to do so, that means you're dealing with a language that's stronger than it should be. There is lack of context for your validation, which makes your piece of code to become a cog in the weird machine, because there is way too much context to begin with. And you'd be better off with a simpler input language. SQL servers, that um, is, uh, I mean, they've become, they, they are known for their uh, various forms of uh, SQL injection. Now, again, this is a recognizer failure. What escapes the escape symbol? Being able to slip in an unescaped escaped symbol is a failure of the recognizer. Not understanding that you're dealing with a language problem of what is a valid escape sequence is, and not building the right automaton to address that leads to uh, SQLI. Memory managers, heaps, well, they're quite complex, aren't they? And they are exploited left and right because uh, of metadata overrides, because of uh, hip feng shui uh, that uh, Alexander Soterov uh, discovered. In each one of those cases, a piece of code looking into the data cannot make a determination of whether the next step of patching uh, a doubly linked list or writing this buffer uh, will actually be correct in the context because there, there is way too much context. And of course, one familiar example, which everyone has been speaking, that of buffer overflows over writing return pointers on the stack. Well, this also works because the stacks, the valid stacks are a language. In fact, that language is so complex that to unwind the stack frames, you need a fully Turing complete virtual machine, which is what the dwarf standard provides. And uh, you may uh, look back uh, to a previous Schmuckon and the paper on that that we released. So in order to avoid the cogs of the C code that you're writing, becoming the cogs of a weird machine, you should make sure that you're exactly validating the uh, language that you expect your pointers to address. And if you're not, if you feel you're unable to do that, that's because uh, the design prevents you from doing so. That context is barreling around, and uh, that is the problem. It's not that C programmers are more prone to making mistakes than everyone else. <laughs> An implicit recognizer is the worst kind of a recognizer. When you have your validation code scattered through your processing code, this is really, really bad. Because you have a whole lot of information flow from uh, your input processing code to your actual uh, worker code. And that means you're creating so much extra state that you do not expect that the reliable transitions that are um, driven uh, by the input are almost inevitable. So don't process what you can't recognize. Full recognition before processing. If you can't confirm that a string is actually a member of the language that you're expecting, and you have a clear idea in the first place of what is it that you are expecting, just don't do it. Regard all valid and expected inputs as a formal language. Know and be strict about what your input language is. And at this point, some of you are thinking, ah, what about the Postel principle? We'll patch the Postel principle. Never, never fear. And of course, use the matching computational power. Uh, the best way to do that is to actually define your language with a grammar and generate your recognizer from that grammar. And not put any semantic actions into that recognizer before you're sure it's done. Otherwise, you're creating a weird machine. 
no more Turing complete input languages or else the Turing beast will emerge and eat that girl's safe computing future. <laughs> All right, so just hitting this again, um, the recursively enumerable languages are the ones we want to stay away from. Context sensitive if we absolutely must. Context free is ideal, so is regular. We must reduce computing power greed in order to keep the Turing beast from eating our investments. So how do we actually go about doing that? We should prevent messages that are sent by some components from being recognized as something completely different by others. And by now, you probably realize that this picture is called a lady with a two bold gentleman. Um, and of course, a little bit of a Star Trek uh, font right there uh, is another example of the same thing. So as long as you are making software by composing it, the question of are you seeing what I'm seeing is paramount. Insecurity is miscommunication. We've talked about the first type of a halting problem, the inability to recognize input safely and to reject bad input safely. Now we must adapt to the rest of the internet, that is to say the two component and three and more component systems. So a realization is that every time your components communicate, every time there is a communication boundary, recognizers are involved. You cannot trust authentication, like no one I don't know will ever talk to me and say a bad thing, to stand for recognition. I can handle everything I hear. It's a serious mistake that is unfortunately make, made in way too many SCADA protocols and other critical applications. So we have this problem of messages being understood exactly as they are meant. So what's a practical example of that? Well, we have a few of them. Uh, who here remembers Moxie Marlin Spike's Null Terminator attack from Black Hat 2009? We totally found that one at exactly the same time. That was one of our 20. Um, so for those of you who don't remember how that one worked, it used to be the case that you could submit a CSR, certificate signing request, to a certificate authority that, you know, it's been long enough that I don't actually remember which implementation was which anymore, so we're just gonna call them A and B. So you submit a CSR to a certificate authority running X509 implementation A. And the common name, is say www. Uh, like www.paypal.com no character dot bad guy dot com and you control bad guy dot com. So the, the the implementation A treats uh, the null character as just part of that string like it's supposed to be according to ASN one and says, oh, sure, I'll sign that because you've proven to me that you own badguy.com, bad guy fine. Um, so then you get back a signed certificate that says, you, that says sure, you've got, uh, you, you've got the www.paypal.com nullterminator.badguy.com null subdomain lockdown, bully for you. Cool, well then you present that, uh, you present that certificate to a browser running implementation B that speaks an ever so slightly different dialect of X509 in which it thinks that, oh, hey, that null terminator, that's where it stops. And it treats that certificate as a completely valid cert for paypal.com. Congratulations, you can fish anybody you want. Or, you know, my, my, my personal favorite example from this one was, um, so the object identifier in, AS, uh, in, in X509 for a, um, for a common name is 2.5.4.3. So it used to be the case, this is not the case anymore, but it used to be the case that you could submit a CSR that included the object ID string pair uh, 2.5.4.2 to the 32nd plus 3 and paypal.com. And 
a, a, a now X509 uses ASN1, which is supposed to use uh, which is supposed to use big nums. So you're supposed to have like arbitrary arbitrary uh, size integers. So OID 2.5.4. Very large number. Sure, whatever you can have that. But then you go and present the resulting cert to Internet Explorer. There was an integer overflow bug in uh, in uh, in Crypto API and. Crypto API interpreted that as 2.5.4.3. Oh, hi, common name, paypal.com. Nice to see you. It, it was all kinds of ridiculous crap like that. And we really did just stop when we got bored. So why is this the case? Well, wow, and I totally just skipped, I totally should have just skipped ahead to that slide. I suck. <laughs> Anyways, um, okay, so why did this happen? Well, so... It happens to be the case that when your input language is sufficiently strong, which is to say stronger than deterministic context free, and I'll get into what that means in just a second, um, but if, you, if, if your input language is stronger than deterministic context free, it is not possible to determine whether two separate implementations of that grammar are in fact recognizing the same language. Like I said before, this totally works for regular. Totally works for deterministic context-free, but for anything stronger, that problem is undecidable, and that is why we could still go back and pull out O-day after O-day after O-day in X509 if it weren't just, you know, old news. I can pull here the no A <laughs> on one side. Ad hoc protest signs, fuck yeah. So, we also run into this problem, curiously enough, with, uh, with IDSs. IDSs were an ingenious attempt to convert the problem of a weak recognizer that you can't trust, that just goes belly up and exposes itself to the uh, crafted inputs and then does whatever the crafted inputs uh, make it do. So it was an attempt to exchange that problem for a different problem. Here, we'll have a more powerful, a more armored recognizer that is going to protect us. It's going to examine the input, uh, decide on whether it is uh, to be accepted or rejected, and only then it will pass this to the more vulnerable component. Now, as you remember, the problem of uh, computational equivalence for uh, languages that are computationally strong is very hard or undecidable. So what happened there was that this defender component had to see exactly the same message and interpret the same message as the target. Otherwise, this commuting of one halting problem to another would totally fail. And what uh, happened there was, well, uh, the four horses of the, of the IDS apocalypse, insertion, deletion, evasion, and, and others. Ptachik and Newsham uh, did that on the hacker side. Uh, Vern Paxson has a series of papers on this on the academic side. But basically, simple enough tricks such as reordering segments, introducing segments that would not check out on the uh, target, but did check out on the IDS because it was lazy and wasn't doing the CRC computation, uh, and all the other uh, tricks that cause the computation on this input to be different on the supposed protector than on the protectee caused the IDS to sign off on it and the protector uh, got popped as before. So what really happened here is that we're looking at the conservation of the bad computational power. You designed a complex protocol, you cannot parse it safely you cannot destroy that power once you've created it. And most importantly, um, as, we, as we illustrated just now with IDSs and X509, you can unintentionally create 
computational power at a boundary of competence, which is to say a boundary where messages are passed from one component to another. If you, if you, if you have one dialect on one side and one dialect on the other, and you're, and you're unable to determine whether those dialects are the same dialect or not, you're hosed. You've just introduced a Turing machine into your system. Which is programmable by the attacker's inputs. Congratulations. I uh, think chess Good job. Yep. <laughs> nice job breaking it, Hero. So if you need to throw more complexity to protect your system from the problem that flows from there being too much complexity in the first place, you, you may have to do so. You may have to resort to IDSs. But the problem is that you are not really removing computational power. You are just commuting one halting problem into another. Uh, this is not a way forward. A way forward is to design such protocols that you won't have to solve it. So in the, coming, uh, in the coming weeks, I will be putting together some materials on how to actually do this from a software engineering perspective. I realize we haven't touched on that terribly much. But uh, the takeaway from this is choose the simplest possible input language you can get away with, preferably regular, at most deterministic complex free, because otherwise we cannot have computational equivalence for all protocol endpoints. And we so should. And we really, really need it. So, Postel, we talked about that for, uh, we talked about that a little earlier. We got to wrap this up pretty quick here, so. John Postel originally said, you know, back when the internet was, uh, was new, be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. We needed this. You know, this was, this was something Len, you know, kicked me about over and over again. Look, we, we needed Postel's principle in order to make the internet happen, in order to, in order to make it work, because there was a lot we had to tweak along the way just to, just to get this damn thing working at all. But its misreadings have made the internets the way we are now. So we propose the following patch. Rather than being liberal about what you accept, be definite about what you accept. Treat input as a language, accept it with a matching computational automaton, generate recognizers directly from grammars, treat input handling computational power as privilege and reduce that as far as you can. So at the end of the day, do not let your protocols or the boundaries of competence where people implement them, uh, that people implement them, um, implement them across to grow up to be Turing complete. Ambiguity is insecurity. If there, if there is any wiggle room in the definition of your protocol, yes, I'm looking at you ECMAScript and you ASN1 and yeah, don't even get me started. Ambiguity makes it far too easy for implementers to just innocently screw up and then you end up with different dialects and rocks fall, everyone dies. If your application relies on a Turing complete protocol, it's not going to be possible to secure. So just don't do that. I mean, don't mistake complexity for functionality. If, 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 if somebody's trying to sell you on, oh, hey, you can save money on, on upgrades because you can just extend our product, you know, because look, it embeds Lua, yay! It embeds Lua right there in data. Run, run very far, run very fast. Because really, at the end of the day, money talks. Money talks. So we all know of integration horror stories, of projects that fell through and will continue to fall through because things just wouldn't work together. And when they did, they wouldn't work together for you. They worked together for the attacker. The common theme of this is that your message formats, your communication protocols cannot be uh, too complex. For the sake of your users, you should keep them simple. And they represent a misinvestment of money and effort. They represent situations when you just can't seem to be able to write enough tests. And the reason why you can't seem to write enough tests is that, yep, is that if you put all of those tests together, you would have an engineering solution to the halting problem, which is not quite possible. And we're done. Any questions? <laughs>